Allison. Uh, Reverend Allison, she's a doctor in philosophy. She's pastor, educator, and organizer who works for justice, justice and healing in her community. She works for the American Friends Services Committee as the national organizer of the Apartheid Free Communities Initiative. And she is a pastor of public witness at BPFNA Partner Congregation Lakeshore Avenue Baptist Church in Oakland, California. And she serves as the Alliance of Baptist Palestine Advocacy Representative. So without further ado, we just want to thank her. Thank you, Allison, for being here. And um, thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing with us this time. Uh, the time is, is, is yours. Uh, remember, everybody, if you want to share your questions on the chat at the end, we will have time to read them and ask, uh, I'll leave Alison to respond to them or, or DJ in case uh, it's a, a specific question. Thank you, Alison. Thank you so much. BPFNA for having me. Um, I, I consider you part of my extended Baptist family and it's good to be together, good to see familiar faces. Um, thank you for giving time and space for GJ to speak because in these days when um, it's hard to know who to believe and news media says different things, politicians certainly say different things, uh, it's essential that we slow down and listen to Palestinian voices. So GJ for sharing your truth, uh, for sharing your experiences and the experiences of your family to help us put into context uh, what is really happening. Thank you. I wanna acknowledge when, when, when we first got together to, to have this session, um, it was a few months ago, we, we had no clue uh, of what was, would have happened 13 days ago. And I would argue that there are direct connections between the original conversation we were going to have about Israeli apartheid and what we just saw, uh, that those two are deeply connected. Um, violence begets violence. And the root causes of the violence that we are seeing in the land that we call holy is based on the violence of Israel's apartheid structure, their settler colonial practices, and their military occupation. What can we do? One of the things that I wanna to talk to you about is the apartheid free initiative, the opportunity to, to make a communal pledge to work to end, work together in community uh, to end uh, all complicity with all complicity with Israeli apartheid. It's a pledge that BPFNA has already courageously and prophetically taken, and one that I hope that your various congregations and communities um, will take or will engage in a process of discerning whether to take it. That process sometimes takes a long time, and that's okay. But but education of why this is important is 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 part of part of what it means to take seriously what is happening. Um, before I transition into the apartheid free uh, communities initiative, um, I do wanna say that that is a long-term solution. That is a solution that gets at root causes. And because this moment is so dire um, and because people are fleeing for their lives, there is a need to take more immediate actions as well. And so I've just put a few of those uh, in the chat, um, places to donate um, to on the ground uh, organizations that are seeking to provide resources, ways in which you can call your representatives now to demand a ceasefire. Um, and for those of you who are interested, uh, tomorrow and every Friday uh, at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern and every hour in between, depending on where you're living, um, American Friends Service Committee has created an action hour in which people can come and join a Zoom for an hour 
and not only get updates from on the ground, but get immediate ways to contact your representatives and write letters during that hour. So it's a way to communally take action together. Uh, I encourage you to consider joining that. Um, so with that said, and I hope and trust you're finding ways to engage um, with addressing this immediate crisis and the immediate violence. Um, let me pull back a minute and share with you about the apartheid free pledge and the invitation to become an apartheid free congregation and apartheid free community. Um, the apartheid free um, communities movement began uh, about a year ago. There was a realization that post COVID, post 2020, there has now been consensus among every major human rights organization that what is taking place in Israel and Palestine is apartheid. Reports came out from Amnesty International, from Human Rights Watch, from Palestinian organizations like Al Haq, and of course South Africans uh, have been able to point out along with Palestinians who have long said our situation is apartheid, and even Israeli human rights organizations such as B'Tselem and Yeshdin have offered thorough researched reports naming apartheid. So we're in a moment of consensus and that presents an opportunity. Second, as um, uh, Dr. Pagan noticed, uh, mentioned, we, we have to be following the lead of Palestinians and Palestinian civil society has said to the international community that one of the things you can do to stand in solidarity with us is to create apartheid free zones. And so apartheid free communities is a US version uh, and really lifting up the role of a faith community in saying we want to do this and we want to find ways um, to create apartheid free zones within our churches, within our congregations, within our communities. And Palestinian Christians have also reached out very specifically to the international Christian church to say, if God the liberator is going to be manifest in our story, then you have to be the incarnation of God standing with us, challenging the forces that we are battling some of the greatest forces on earth, namely the United States government. So in response to Palestinian civil society and Palestinian Christians, the um, development of apartheid free communities came about. And I also wanna say that um, the idea of apartheid free zones and specifically of apartheid free churches is deeply connected to the role of the church in ending South African apartheid. Churches played a very specific role in naming with a moral voice, the evil of apartheid in such a way that politicians who were ignoring it were forced to pay attention. And of course the United States was the last country to acknowledge South African apartheid and sadly it will likely be very similar. Um, and yet there is a role in the faith community to, to demand that this uh, moral injustice be addressed. Um, let me give you, um, I would like to share my screen and give you um, just the slightest, slightest thumbnail sketch of, um, in, 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 in two screens. Oh, and I might not. Let's see, let's see if I can do it. I'm not tech savvy enough to do it in the most beautiful way, but I'll just show you my background. I just wanna give you two slides. Um, oh, and you even get all the notes. I don't know how to do this. Um, but let me just, um, and now my screen's gone like, oh dear. So according to the International Convention on the Suppression of, punish, of the Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, apartheid is described, is defined as inhumane acts committed for the purpose 
of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systemically oppressing them. The United Nations has given us a very clear definition of what apartheid is. These definitions were created in response to what was happening in South Africa, and they do not only apply to South Africa, but any place where this structure has taken place. The Jim Crow South in the United States was clearly an apartheid regime, and one that I dare say those of us in the United States need to continue working to dismantle the effects of. There are three decisive conditions um, that, that must be met for something to be named apartheid. One, a system of separation or segregation for the purpose of domination. And this can be done based on race, creed, or ethnicity. Two, the system of separation is legally enforced. It is enshrined in law. And three, it includes human rights violations. All three of these will be, all three of these standards are met fully when you listen to Palestinians and consider their reality. Amnesty International has a fabulous 13 minute video spelling out their legal case for what's happening on the ground and why it's apartheid. It's fabulous. I was going to show it to you tonight. I've actually changed my mind, but it will be um, in the follow-up email. And um, uh, Erica, you can put a link to that in the chat. But what I wanna show you instead is a video in which Reverend Michael Ware, a uh, member of BPFNA board, uh, and myself were on a delegation to bear witness to apartheid this May. And they've put together a video of our experiences. So in the nature of relationship, and in the nature of storytelling. I thought this might be uh, a good way to share with you. Um, and again, I need just a moment. Oh, yeah. um, but this, I thought this would be a good way um, to share with you some of what we witnessed um, and, um, and keep in mind the definitions of apartheid as you're listening. So me, who, who grew up here, I'm asking you, a person from very far away, to please push your congressman to push to end the occupation, to, to actually let these people remain in their house. In May 2023, the American Friends Service Committee led a delegation of faith leaders on a journey to Palestine. Their mission to bear witness to the harsh realities of Israeli apartheid. Throughout their journey, they encountered a matrix of control that affected every aspect of daily life for Palestinians. Systematically displacing and dispossessing Palestinians from their land, communities, resources, and culture. This video shares what the delegation witnessed and how they are working with Palestinians and Israelis to end Israeli apartheid, settler colonialism, and military occupation through the creation of apartheid-free communities. On their first day together, the delegation walked from the old city of Jerusalem to an area in East Jerusalem called Soban, where the Israeli government continues to evict Palestinians from their homes to make way for Israeli settlers. In the hills, the murals of the International Art Project, Eyewitness Silwan, depicted the eyes of local and international leaders, activists, and artists. Visible from tourist attractions and Israeli settlements, these eyes not only beckon viewers to bear witness to Palestinian displacement, but also dare to challenge occupying forces with their own gazes. Their message echoed throughout the journey. The stories of everyday Palestinians need to be seen and heard. Perhaps the most stark example of the fragmentation and isolation of Palestinian communities is the ongoing blockade of Gaza that began in 2007. Because the delegation was not able to get Israeli military-issued permits to enter Gaza, Delegates connected with AFSC staff living in Gaza via Zoom 
to virtually tour the 25-mile stretch of land along the Mediterranean Sea. While speaking with staff about the work they are doing alongside local communities, Israeli F-16 fighter jets could be heard in the distance bombing Gaza. Despite the imminent threat, AFSC staff continued with the Zoom call and rejected the suggestions by the delegates to end the call and seek shelter. Nowhere here is safe, replied the staff. The bombing would continue for five days, with the escalated military attacks resulting in the deaths of 34 Palestinians and one Israeli. The delegation's path led to Amil Her, a Bedouin village in the South Hebron Hills of the West Bank that constantly faces the risk of demolition and displacement despite the residents having legal ownership of the land. The families of Amil Her are descendants of Palestinians who were forced off their lands in Al Arad and the Cobb Desert during the 1948 war. Since 2007, the Israeli army has repeatedly demolished their homes and infrastructure and restricted their access to lands for grazing their livestock. If we ask everyone in Um Al Khair what their dreams are, all of them will mention water, electricity, good house. We are not asking about jobs or, I mean, like travels or cars or, or money or whatever. We want to feel safe. In Al Arkib, a village in the northern Naqab Desert within Israel, the delegation met with Sheikh Saya Aturi and his son Aziz who shared their struggle to remain on their historic lands and preserve their culture threatened by settler colonialism and repeated demolitions. Despite holding Israeli citizenship, the villagers of al Arkib and other Palestinian citizens of Israel don't necessarily fare any better than their Palestinian counterparts living under occupation. No democracy. No democracy when we ask the government to recognize our area, our land. No, it's state land. Our keep has been demolished over 217 times since 2010. According to Mohammed Zaidan, former director of the Arab Association for Human Rights, apartheid for Palestinian citizens of Israel functions in four ways. One, legal direct discrimination, such as exclusive rights of Jewish people, including the nation state law, the law of return, and the laws governing the use of land. Two, legal indirect discrimination, including access to jobs and resources linked to military service. Three, institutional discrimination, including the distribution of educational and community resources. Four, public opinion, including discrimination encouraged in the public sphere in the rise of racist attacks against Palestinians. Since the year 2000, Israel has arrested 13,000 Palestinian children between the ages of 12 and 18. In the occupied West Bank, Israeli settlers are subject to Israeli civilian laws, while Palestinians live under military law. Over 600 children are under house arrest in Jerusalem. One such child is Shadi Hori, a 16-year-old student attending a Quaker school in Ramallah. The delegation met Shadi and his family while he remained under house arrest, seven months after being beaten and dragged from his bedroom in the middle of the night, falsely accused of throwing stones. They have turned our home into a prison, said Shadi's mother. Shadi was awaiting a court hearing the week we visited, and we asked if he and his family had hope. When justice is on your side, you can't lose hope, said his grandmother. We don't have the luxury to lose hope, his mother added. As the delegation's time drew to a close, the group toured the remains of the village of Ma'alul near Nazareth. During the creation of Israel, over 500 Palestinian villages were destroyed and approximately 750,000 Palestinians were forcibly removed. Ma'alul was one such village that was destroyed, and it serves as a haunting reminder of the foundation of displacement, destruction, and dispossession that the state of Israel was founded upon. Feeling the weight of all they had witnessed over the past week, the delegates left the tour of Ma'alul with an even stronger commitment to return home and tell the truth of what they witnessed and to empower their communities to take action to end this ongoing catastrophe. The situation in Palestine is dire. From 1948 to today, the state of Israel has been destroying lives, families, and whole communities. But together, we can join hands and rise up following the steadfast leadership of Palestinians themselves. Together, we can work to end apartheid and ensure freedom for the Palestinian people and all people. We invite you to join the American Friends Service Committee in signing the Apartheid Free Communities Pledge, standing alongside a growing network of faith communities, nonprofits, businesses, and institutions committed to dismantling Israeli apartheid. Visit apartheid-free.org to take the pledge.
So that brings you just a little bit on the journey um, with Michael Ware and I. And when we end the video with the destruction, with the, with the witnessing of the remains of a destruction of a Palestinian village from 1948 in which people were forcibly removed from their land, I invite you to think of ways in which Gazans right now are being forcibly removed from their lands. And if you wonder what is at the root of all this violence, see what happens to that land once Palestinians have been removed from it. It's a very familiar, heartbreaking story. So what do we do? We take action. We do what we can to speak truth about what's really happening. To speak truth to power to the extent that we have access and can. We band together with other communities and networks so that we can speak in a much larger, united Christian voice, united interfaith voice, united voice on the side of humanity. What I'd like to do is I would like to show you the website for Apartheid Free, and then I'll pause and take questions. I, there's, I see there's some hands and some good questions in the chat, but let me, let me uh, lay out uh, everything and then we'll and then we'll go there. Um, the the website for apartheid free can be found at apartheid-free.org. Trying to make it uh, trying to make it simple. So you go to apartheid-free. Don't forget the dash. It's essential. Apartheid-free.org and you'll find uh, our website. You'll find a little bit of history and the ways in which um, a variety of different uh, faith communities came together uh, to create this pledge and then the ways in which it's it expanded uh, internationally. There are three basic components of the pledge. Learn. Learn about apartheid. Share with others about apartheid. Take a pledge and the pledge both names apartheid and commits to taking action and then take action. What action can you take? We actually specifically left this a little bit vague because we recognize that communities are in very different places and we want every community wherever you are to take the pledge. So if you don't know much and you can do a Bible study on apartheid, based on what Palestinian Christians have shared with the international community, that's a fabulous action. If you've been doing this a while and are ready to engage in advocacy, yes, we want you. If you're willing to put up a poster in your congregation that says that you made a commitment to be apartheid free and invite others to join the pledge, that's a great action. If you are ready to engage in divestment, that's a fabulous action and we provide tools and equipment to engage in each of these actions. It was written on the uh, screen in the movie, but, but let me just say out loud, make sure that everyone has a chance to uh, read the pledge. We affirm our commitment to freedom, justice, and equality for Palestinian people and all people. We oppose all forms Come on. We oppose all forms of racism, bigotry, discrimination, and oppression. We declare ourselves an apartheid free community. And to that end, we pledge to join others in working to end all support of Israel's apartheid regime, settler colonialism, and military occupation. And that last pledge, the language from that pledge, comes specifically from Palestinian civil society um, and we're following their lead. I do wanna show you, um, you can go to our website. Um, oh, 
we don't want to go to that one. So let's go back to the main page. You can go on our website uh, underneath the pledge. There's a list of pledge signers. And these committees, uh, these groups are actually part of a, a leadership coalition that has formed and has representatives. Um, and then you can click on the full list. And you'll be able to see as of October 7th. And uh, now it's, uh, I know there's at least half a dozen more that I need to add. There are 162 apartheid free communities. 71 of those are faith based communities. We have a variety of congregations from throughout the United States. We have a few Kenyan congregations um, and uh, eager to have more countries represented. We have four denomination level communities, the Alliance of Baptists, the Disciples of Christ, South Central Yearly Meeting of the Quakers and the United Church of Christ. And then you can see a list of faith communities. And I draw your attention to number two on this list, Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America, Bautistas Por La Paz. And I show you this to, to let you see that you're in good company as you consider taking this pledge. And when you take the pledge, not only do you make a commitment to take action, but you become part of this network that supports one another, that shares resources, that is prepared to stand with one another should any particular communities um, be attacked. To this moment, no one has received negative feedback for taking this pledge, but we are prepared that when that might happen, um, we have um, uh, legal defense teams, we have solidarity teams. Um, we especially, if it happens to be a, a, a Christian, well, actually, if it happens to be a non-Jewish group, we have strong Jewish partnership in this. And uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% of our signatories are Jewish, including a few synagogues uh, and a variety of uh, Havaraz and other um, Jewish Voice for Peace chapters, um, a Jewish nonviolence orgs. Um, so we do have a, a significant um, Jewish contingent that is uh, that actually was thrilled when they heard that a Christian coalition was creating this and said, we want to be part of it. And we've created ways uh, for them to do organizing within their own circles um, and to create interfaith ways in which we can speak in a united voice. Um, I think, oh, the last thing I do want to say is that the Apartheid Free Pledge is very intentionally for communities rather than individuals. There are a lot of different ways in which individuals can sign petitions. Those are all very important. Um, and we think there's a need for communities to speak as a whole, and most importantly, to do that really hard work of saying, I know what's right. Not everyone in my church knows what's right. We need to talk about this as a church because of the moral imperative and because the values of our faith are so aligned with this pledge. We want congregations wrestling with this. We want faith communities saying, I'm not sure about this, but we will commit to having those tough conversations. And if you do the hard work of educating your community and your community is not ready to take the pledge, you will have succeeded in making a tremendous difference because of that education that will continue to bear fruit going forward. So, um, so, so the reason why we really wanted communities to take this pledge um, is, is to honor that. And, and I know in Baptist churches, when we have radical democracy, uh, that can take a while and that's okay. This is, a, this is a, sometimes a multi-year um, effort to even sign the pledge and certainly a multi-year effort in living it out. Um, so let me let me stop there. I think um, you got the gist of what the pledge is about. Now let's uh, see what questions you have and uh, start talking about um, what it might mean for for you and your community to take this back to them. Oh, actually, let me also say, sorry, on the apartheid free website, there's a significant section of resources, um, resources that give those um, human rights uh, reports resources that provide study guides, resources that um, uh, to talk about a variety of different, what the Anglican Church of South Africa, I think just um, named Israeli apartheid. And so there's an article there. So, so you can see the, the growing way in which people are um, uh, naming apartheid and rising up to, to do what they can. 
No, I'll stop. Allison, thank you so much for giving us um, this this background in apartheid. We have a few questions in the chat, and I also see your hand there, Barb. Um, we'll uh, we'll start with some of the ones um, that uh, well, one of the ones that that, that rises up that was asked um, previously. Ray asks, "Is there an opportunity, or will there be an appropriate time for faith leaders from the international community to go and stand with Palestinians?" Um, could we stand in front of the Israeli occupiers to deter them? And so I, th I guess that's a question about um, uh, in-person in action. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, in fact, I was just hearing today, you know, on the Quaker Networks, um, my colleagues are really in the thick of what's happening. And there was a, uh, someone had raised the suggestion of what if we have um, the faith community come to the southern border of Gaza where they're not letting in humanitarian aid and just being uh, our own uh, barricade of morality saying you must let things in. I don't know whether that will actually materialize or not, but several ideas often get floated. Um, I myself like to go Kairos Palestine um, uh, at least every other year has an international gathering of representatives of Christian organizations to strategize together uh, with Palestinian Christians about how we can represent the international uh, Christian church. Um, and so, uh, so ideas get floated and as any of them really solidify um, because Baptist Peace Fellowship is part of the apartheid free network, uh, Jason gets uh, emails that um, provide a variety of uh, way, invitations to action. And so um, he would be alerted about that right away and mm -hmm. be able to uh, spread the invitation as well. Thank you. I'll, I'll hand it over, Barb. Get um, a question. Actually, um, a couple of things. One of them is that years ago at an Amnesty International convention, uh, we had a speaker, a white South African former prisoner of conscience, who informed us that the correct pronunciation is not apartheid, but apartheid. And I think it's really important for us to think of it in those terms because it is a separation because there is hatred between groups. And that's something really important to, to pay attention to. Uh, the second thing is that at this point in what is occurring in the area of Palestine and Israel, it's important for us to be making phone calls to our legislators to really be activist in what we're doing. And right now, legislators and all branches of the government are receiving about 10 to one calls from the very well-organized group of um, people who are supporting Israel uh, and its current politics, which is not good. That, that's APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and other groups. And um, it's really important for us to multiply our calls so that they see that there is a group of people who are calling for a ceasefire for humanitarian aid and things of that sort. And um, we are going to be doing this in an environment in which the US government is cracking down on people for asking for a ceasefire and for peace. And you need to try to not be afraid that they will crack down. I have been involved in demonstrations and events. And I think that the more of us who come out, the more we can push back against those government orders, which are very, very hateful and um, actually self-defeating because a lot of people who didn't oppose the US government are now be beginning to do so because uh, of the totally pro-Israel stance that the government is taking. Thank you. <laughs> I I, I do want to lift up that silencing and crackdown. Next week, I was um, going to attend the very first in-person gathering of apartheid-free communities. And it was connected to uh, the, uh, the, the conference put on by the, um, uh, by U the, the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. It was going to be the day before that. 
And in Houston, the powers that be, the pro-Israel powers were able to pressure the hotel enough that they canceled all of our reservations and they canceled hosting the conference and the conference is now been canceled. We cannot meet because there was such a fear of having a group get together and talk about Palestine. So that's that's the level of silencing. I um, last week I did a an event where I at my church where I had a Palestinian come and speak and share his stories and and Facebook removed our ad about that because um, they thought that event might be offensive to some. So there 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 is a strong si silencing force, and that is where naming apartheid in community. I mean, speaking basic truth is essential. I want to go um, to a live, a couple of live questions. Um, Beth, uh, you've got your hand up. I think you were. You Thank you, Jason. I live in Rochester, New York, western part of New York State, and we've had a Witness Palestine Film Festival here in Rochester for 10 or 11 years held at a local art theater in the downtown part of the city of Rochester. Um, a week ago, we had an invited speaker that was going to be here in person to kick off the festival. And this event was going to be at the Islamic Center of Rochester with Middle Eastern food, a wonderful event. And because of pressure against the Islamic Center and because of pressure against our Palestine group, we had to make that event online. Then starting on this Saturday, the film festival itself was going to take place in the art theater in downtown Rochester. And again, because of great pressure and threats, we had to move the film festival to be online. However, the newspaper publicity about the speaker being not allowed to come and that event in person not being held and now the film festival not being held in person but online has brought us wonderful publicity. We're gonna have people from many other places joining the films, I'm sure. So that's some good news. And if you wanna join in, you, the films are free. They're gonna be wonderful. The first one on Saturday is called Israelism, which you can't see anywhere else except in film festivals. It's about two young American Jews that rethink what they had learned growing up about the government of Israel. And if you want to join that, you go to WPFF, that's Witness Palestine Film Festival. Dot org and you can join on for free. Love to see you. I, I could amend that a little bit because it's WPFF.us. WPFF.us, three o'clock in Eastern Time this Saturday, and also three o'clock Eastern Time this Sunday are the first two films, and you're all invited. But you have to register. Uh, your intention to come because we have to create safeguards of who who gets in. Thanks, thanks Beth, thanks Dick uh, for that invitation. Um, a, a question, Allison, that came up earlier, and now they've um, had to had to log off. But Anita and Lee in Seattle asked, um, "Do you have wisdom?" for how to honor the fear that some of their Jewish members in their congregation are feeling about rising anti-Semitism right now and strongly call for an end to violence and an end to the occupation. Yeah, so what an important question and um, a, a few things I wanna say on that. Anti-Semitism is rising in the wake of the attacks on Israelis, several in the Jewish community are extremely fearful and we need to be aware of that and recognize that pain. And anti-Semitism as a term is frequently used to silence any type of conversation about what's happening to Palestinians. And, and so we, we need to hold both of these. Uh, we can't be naive. 
uh, we can't be simplistic, but we can be clear. We can be clear that this pledge, which is against racism of all forms, includes it is against anti Semitism and Islamophobia. We can acknowledge that when Israel practices apartheid, it is creating an environment that is not safe for Israelis. We can acknowledge that many in our Jewish community are doing everything they can to say our faith demands that we challenge injustice, even as we want it challenged if it's happening to us. So, so let me name all of that. I, I know for my congregation, when we're studying the pledge, it's important that we have information about anti-Semitism. At the same time, we, we need to be clear that to be against any type of um, racial or ethnic uh, prejudice means to be against all racial and ethnic prejudice. And the way in which that gets played out, we need to uh, be careful of. And Israel works very hard to conflate the state of Israel with the Jewish people, and that is completely inaccurate. The Israeli state is a settler colonial state that tries to co-opt Judaism for its purposes. Not all Jewish people are Israeli. Not all Israeli people are Jewish. Not all Jewish people are Zionists or pro-Israeli. Quite frankly, not all Zionists are Jewish. And as some of you may know, the largest pro-Israel lobby group in the United States is the Christian Zionists. Christian Zionists outnumber Jewish people in this country 10 to 1, in the United States, I'm sorry, in the United States 10 to 1. So, so, um, so, so things can get very complicated. And you can say apartheid is wrong, period. Anti-Semitism is wrong. And, and, and I want to be honest that that will not be heard by everyone and that you can be accused of anti-Semitism, whether or not um, that's accurate. And so you need to do some work internally to know where you stand um, and who your partners are. And I promise you, whatever city you live in, there are anti-Zionist Jews who are willing to stand with you. And I can help you connect. Mm. Thank you, Allison, for that emphatic and we we hear that. Um, a, a quest, uh, I'll, I'll give it now to uh, Garth. Uh, would you like to ask a, a question live? Uh, actually a comment. Um, uh, because uh, the yeah, I get most of my information on YouTube following various bloggers. One blogger I would like to mention is uh, Katie Halper. Maybe some of you already know that name. Um, she's Jewish uh, blogger, uh, very progressive, and she's been uh, having constant uh, interviews with Norman Finkelstein, who is uh, excellent on uh, elaborating uh, some of the things which... Uh, Pastor Allison just now said. Uh, the other thing, though, is that on uh, YouTube, uh, when I uh, I seek out Al Jazeera, they started putting a banner over the Al Jazeera English saying uh, this uh, channel and this program is uh, being paid for, uh, being sponsored by uh, Arab uh, nations. Uh, that isn't the exact language, but it's something to that effect. And I got to thinking, well, that's very interesting. <laughs> I know that. That's why I choose to watch Al Jazeera. I wonder why don't they put that same banner on CNN mm. and a few other places? I mean, why doesn't mm -hmm. MSNBC get a banner saying who's paying for them? Mm -hmm. So, so I know you that know, you're asking really? a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. and there's this fabulous movie, The Occupation of the American Mind, which talks about yep. the power of media to, um, to, to dictate the narrative of what's happening. 
One question I always uh, I like to ask uh, Christians, especially Christian scholars, who bankrolled Jesus? By the way, that is in the Bible. It's in the book of Luke. I think it's uh, chapter 8, verse 2. And who were those women? Were they all Jewish women? No, they were not. Just check it out. Because a lot of times, especially during elections, people are, you know, who's paying for who and whatever. And I think it is a legitimate question to ask who, who bankrolled Jesus and his movement. And it, that's a revealing answer when you, when you look it up. And I just wanted to share that with you. And thank you, Allison, for the great work that you continue to do. And I did want to ask uh, Shimena if she is still here. Uh, has your church taken uh, in Mexico City, ha has uh, your church taken the uh, anti-apartheid pledge? So I'll I wait for my answer. I will. You I may will know jump. that. Well, I will jump in to ask for Jimena, and I don't actually know the answer, but um, she had to uh, step out um, to uh, for for a family reason, uh, and so she's actually not with us. She's still on the screen, but um, yeah, uh, uh, Jason. So you know, I'm calling from Mexico. I live in Mexico. Jason. Yeah. See. Si. Si. Yeah. Uh, See. Si. Yeah. I I I need to 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 leave, but I have. Mitri Raheb has sent a message. And the message is the following. Breaking news. Israel bombed a house bordering on the Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza. I know. Which brought down the assembly hall where around 50 Christians were having refuge. At least a child was murdered and several people injured, all Christians. Many are still under the rubble. This is something that Mitri Raheb has just sent. Namely, there, there is a house in the Greek Orthodox Church in Gaza, which has been bombed by Israel. There is at least one child that and many other people heard. I sent Mitri a message. I need to leave, but I am. Um... <sighs> this has been an excellent conversation and hope that we can do something so that not anymore, more children, more people being killed. So let us pray and and thanks, Jason, this has been, a, and Alison, this has been a extremely excellent conversation. Thank okay. you to all of you. I need okay. to leave. Okay, y por favor, comparte con Mitri eh, nuestras oraciones profundas y solidaridad con, con ellas, por favor. Muy bien. Y gracias. Uh, he said, so please uh, share our prayers with Mitri and our solidarity with them. See you. And um, as we, you know, take in this this breaking news, and um, you know, also, you know, uh, from afar, us, you know, many of us from afar, um, can you talk a little bit about? And this is a very large question, but just, you know, going back to some of the root causes of Palestine becoming dependent to Israel in relation to water and electricity. There was a, this was a question that came a bit earlier, but just to, you know, get, go back and in time and give us a little bit of this, this context as well. So the Zionist project, the project to create an exclusively Jewish state, a Jewish supremacist state um, is to, the, the common slogan that was used is um, the most amount of people with the few amount of Arabs is the vision for the Zionist state. And to get that, um, even though Palestinians, quite frankly, and Jewish people who, had, who are indigenous to the land had have prospered on the land for millennia, um, but one of Israel's strategies is to steal land, 
to still water, to um, to to cut off to cut off water, to cut off electricity is to make life so difficult that Palestinians will self-select to leave and not be made to leave. But in places like the Jordan Valley, I've stood ten feet from an ancient aqueduct in which Israel had built a massive well that dug so deep into the ground that the aqueduct had run dry. And so that, that's the kind of way in which um, uh, water gets stolen, um, land gets stolen by, um, by, by, um, uh, by destroying homes, primarily um, by destroying villages and communities, schools get destroyed. Um, there's, there's a constant uh, harassment and, and, and making life difficult. Uh, and then um, from a legal perspective, uh, shifting resources so that recesses get poured into settlements. Um, the, the, in the video, you saw Um El Kher, and right next to it, you, you could turn and see this massive settlement um, that looked like a suburb. And the people of Um El Kher had very limited electricity and access to water. Um, when, when a stone's throw away, um, there was an abundance of it. In fact, throughout Um El Kher are these power lines so that the settlement can have access to electricity um, that they uh, are not given access to. So uh, one, of the, um, one of the primary strategies um, of settler colonial project of, of, of taking more and more land. Mm -hmm. Bueno, amigos, tenemos algunos minutos más uh, para preguntas. No sé si... Okay, friends, we have a few more minutes for questions. I don't know if there are anybody, if there's anyone who would like to ask any other questions. Or uh, write it on the chat, or you could just open your, uh, your microphone. I want to ask something. Thinking about the of the apartheid and the experience of the indigenous peoples in the United States, in Canada. Um, are there any alliances with indigenous groups so that they can also, you know, become are a voice for uh, the the breakout of this uh, system and structure of of um, of death? It's a it's a question. There, there are direct parallels um, that are that are seen by many who work on um, intersectional uh, decolonial work, uh, recognizing the settler colonialism of uh, Israel with the history of the United States, um, both historically and continuingly, um, as people in Puerto Rico know all too well. Um, and uh, you know, it's it's interesting this pledge says that we pledge to take action to work to end all complicity with Israeli apartheid, settler colonialism, and military occupation, all of which are true. And when I think of apartheid, I think of in the United States, the Jim Crow South. And I have heard Judge Wendell Griffin says it frequently that he grew up in Jim Crow South. And he has visited Palestine and he sees what's happening in Palestine as being worse than what happened in the Jim Crow South. I, apartheid taps into that oppressive racist dynamic that is known all too well in the United States and the settler colonial regime, which is really unfolding very clearly in Gaza right now, um, is deeply, deeply connected to, I dare say modeled after the history of the United States in creating reservations, in forcibly displacing people, in displacing people and then paying people, paying whites to come and live on the land and prosper in it. Um, so it, it's, and, and then of course the military occupation with the international um, uh, presence of the United States military and the military of so many um, uh, countries in power is, is sickening. And so when you have this, trifecta of evils, it's 
it's it's just um it's almost unspeakable except for we have to speak it because it's certainly unlivable and and the second one is um from the theological education area we have not done a good job in in working out the myth of the land of Palestine, the land of Israel. And uh, I think that's something that we have to take responsibility for and, and, and start moving on and, and work in this. I know that you know some churches have done it, but making alliances with seminaries who or, or scholars that are working this and how do we can uh, provide a more wide public uh, um, uh, knowledge and information on this? Because I think it's, it's important because you built up the ideology of the uniqueness of Israel and the end of time and the return, you know, all of that is, is just mixed and built into uh, this um, understanding of the land and who possesses the land or who God gave the land to. And, and I think we need to go back to talk about that the land is not ours. The earth is God's. We just share the land. So that possession of the land, I think that theologically speaking, we can work that out, but it needs for us to also take responsibility of the way we have been telling the story. Absolutely. And, and, and two things I want to say that um, uh, this idea that there's a, a chosen people and that the land belongs to a few people was again, the doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny, it was the same exact theology of white supremacy that created genocide in the United States. Um, so I, I wanna name that. Um, and, and two, the, there's an amazing presence of Palestinian liberation theologians who are doing amazing work. And so there's, there's the possibility of bringing struggles together and bringing together liberation theolo theologians um, from all kinds of oppressed situations to, to say this is, um, this is what liberation looks like. And if you worship a God of liberation, then this is what you must be about. And I, I never learned about Palestinian liberation theology in my seminary. And believe me, I've talked to them about that since. Um, and we we have work to do in, in lifting mm -hmm. up um, the profound um, theology that does exist. Thank you. I have a question. Um, do any of you have communities that you think might take seriously? whether or not they should uh, engage at least in a discernment process to, to sign the pledge. And these can be congregations, these can be seminaries, these can be uh, nonprofits of any type, um, these can be businesses, these can be book groups, these can be any, any group that gets together that could engage in learning more and, and maybe taking the, the step of signing the pledge. Yeah, and feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, um, I, I mentioned on the website that there's a lot of resources. And of course, um, I, I think my email's out there. Jason will share it as yeah. well. But I'm happy to um, help you get connected to, you know, if, 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 if it's a needle in the haystack that you don't want to mess with too much information, talk to me directly about what you're looking for. I'd be happy to help you. And I do want to mention that we have a really good FAQ that's available on our website, both an FAQ for congregations and an FAQ uh, for uh, communities of conscience, non-faith communities. 
And these FAQs end up being very helpful in spelling out what the pledge is and what it isn't and, and making some of these distinctions um, in what we're asking people to do and what, what we're not asking people to do. Mm. Thank you for sharing these in the chat. Um, and yes, we will be sending uh, uh, Allison's information uh, for contacting her um, and contacting our apartheid free. Um, or you can get uh, in touch with her through us, through uh, the Baptist Peace Fellowship, both these Spotify's as well. Um, well, Allison, before I um, before I give it to you to give us a closing um, benediction, word of prayer, it was mentioned, uh, I believe, in the video. Um, we don't have the luxury to lose hope. Many of us do have luxury not to to, to lose hope. Um, perhaps because of our privilege or perhaps because of where we are, how do we shake ourselves out of that if that is something that some of us are feeling? How do we move ourselves beyond that to shake hope into us? What are some final words that you can give us to really stir us um, in, in this moment? If, if you feel like you're losing hope, I encourage you to talk to a Palestinian. The tremendous amount of hope that they have is so humbling. And I let them lead the way in so many ways, particularly the Palestinian Christians. If you don't know Kairos Palestine or haven't read, uh, Kairos Palestine is a gathering of Palestinian Christians and they created a modern day epistle. In the Pauline tradition, a modern day epistle to the international church where they talk about the deep hope they have, in fact, the knowledge they have in their faith that they will be liberated. Um, so, so that's one. I do encourage you, um, I, uh, American Friends Service Committee published a book called Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire. And it is a powerful testament, not only to the horrible conditions in which Gazans have been enduring, but the way in which light shines brightly through it all. And if um, at Haymarket Books is their publisher, they're offering it free for now for anyone who wants to go to their website and get a free copy of it, uh, a free electronic copy of it. And every major uh, bookseller has it, but reading that has been very hopeful. Um, and I, yeah, it's... Uh... Mm. And really quickly, um, before uh, we we leave, I, I will, um, Reverend Juan Alquil uh, Gutierrez Rodriguez from North Shore Baptist Church uh, has a question as well. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not in Chicago anymore. I'm in Puerto Rico, and I'm so happy to be here anyway. Uh, but I just want to make a, a, a concern more than anything else. I have been seeing in the last few years that we are dealing more of what we call uh, just uh, trying to get uh, the fire off when the fire is on. We need to take care of these situations ahead of time. We have been dealing with the Palestinian and Israel situation for the last 50 years, and we are not done our work on, on avoiding this from the beginning. We are doing, uh, we are lost right now everything that going on in the Horn of Africa. You know, we had just don't know anything and they are apartheid there, even if for some groups. And it's a lot of issues that we need to be concerned. Uh, I know that it's a lot, but it's something that we need to start to plan ahead and make sure that some of this stuff can be prevented, whatever can be prevented. And what is not, we can be ready to uh, respond uh, quickly enough to some of these issues. And I'm glad this is, Allison, it was great. I really enjoy it. Uh, this is, was great stuff. Um, but uh, we need to also uh, uh, be uh, attentive to other things that are going on uh, and very close to us, even uh, in the United States, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Doris said, but I uh, just uh, nice to, to see some of you and, and get to know each other. Thank Jason, thanks Allison. 
Muchas gracias, Pastor. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, sí, tenemos que tener el enfoque muy, yes, muy amplio. Sí, tenemos que tener un enfoque muy amplio. Well, I want to um, thank Allison Tanner tonight for leading us in this time um, in uh, what hopefully will be some opportunities for future times as well. I also want to thank G.J. Tarazi for um, leading us as well. And um, Allison, I wanted to see if you might lead us in a final uh, closing benediction prayer at this time. Sure, I'm just uh, responding. Um, okay, um, and I, I did want to say, um, what did I want to say? I, I did want to, I, I want to connect the dots one more time between this conversation we're having on apartheid and what is happening on the ground in Gaza right now. That there, there are direct parallels, there are direct connections um, and, and part of what Juan Angel was, was just saying about the need to see these deep and direct connections and the need to challenge them both at their structural levels and at the manifest level, and ideally before they become so pervasive and so vile is, um, is really important. And the flip side is also true that if we can challenge them at their manifest level, if we can challenge them at their root causes, wherever we can challenge them, we're doing the work to push back against empire, to push back against evil. So I, I, I don't want us to lose hope um, that I, I think there are a multiplicity of ways to get involved, there are multiplicity of ways to do something, um, and then to see our work as really united in challenging empire is, is so important. Um, which is a lot of the connection that BPFNA does. So it's, it's good to be here together. On that note, join me in prayer, God of peace, God of justice, God of love and liberation. We pray to you for an end to the violence, for an end to bombs and rockets and guns and machetes, for an end to vitriol and racism and subjugation of your precious children for an end to the lies that politicians and media sources fuel, to an end to apartheid structures and settler colonial practices and military occupation, to an end to the violence of this moment and the structures that created it. God of love and liberation, we ask forgiveness. When I speak especially as one in the US context, for it is my tax dollars that are being used to fund, to prop up, and to perpetuate this violence. God, we ask for forgiveness for ways in which our governments continue to provide weaponry that kills, that kills Palestinians, that kills indigenous peoples everywhere. God, we ask forgiveness for the ways in which we watch and feel paralyzed to do anything. And so we stick our heads in the sand or we get wrapped up in despair or detachment. For we are not called to solve the problems of the world, but we are called to engage them. And in engaging them, we find our salvation, our liberation. God, we plead for an end to the terrorizing structures that perpetuate violence, and we implore your intervention for a just peace that we know can emerge. And even as we pour you for your intervention, may we commit ourselves to take action as we are able in the communities we are part of. May we do what we can to follow your ways of peace, of justice, of love, and of the work of liberation. Amen. <laughs>